Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you don't mind if I actually announce the songs as we go through them. This is really for two reasons. I know perfectly well that you've got um, sumptuous program notes there, but having had program notes myself, I know they're sometimes very difficult to read. Either the lights go down or somebody talks to you, you're going, or you think you'll read them when you go home, and you never do. But the better reason is, of course, <laughs> that we are actually broadcasting um, this concert live, and many people at home would obviously like to know exactly what's going on. I'd like for, firstly to say, of course, in this anthology of English song which I have chosen, or tried to choose right from the beginning to the end, of course, we don't always have the correct instruments here. For example, this first group really should be played on, uh, well, a, a, a quartet could sing it, or you could have a quartet of viols, that's like the, the old, um, string quartet, or it could be played on a broken quartet, a broken consort, that is, with um, a viol at the top, a viol at the bottom, many plucked instruments in the middle. Or it, of course, should be sung with a lute. Now, we have a very, very big black lute tonight, and you're going to have to put up with it, I'm afraid. <laughs> anyway, the next song I'd like to sing is In Darkness Let Me Dwell, from a musical banquet of 1610 by John Dowland. <laughs>
The next song is a, a religious song, very simple. It's by Thomas Campion, who wrote the words and music. And I think he wrote the words for most of his songs. He was a very clever fellow. Most of them did, of course, but Campion always did.
And finally, we go back to, to Dowland, who I think must have been the most important of the Lutonist song composers. Thomas Morley also was very grand indeed, but Dowland certainly wrote a lot more music. Now, Come Again, Sweet Love Doth Now Invite, by John Dowland. Come again, sweet love doth now invite Thy graces that refrain To do me due delight To see, to hear, to touch, to kiss, to die With thee again in sweet esteem touch, to kiss, to die with thee again in sweetest sympathy. Come again, that I may cease to mourn, though thy unkind disdain for now left and for long. I sit, I sigh, I weep, I faint, I die in deadly pain and endless misery. I sit, I sigh, I weep, I faint, I die in deadly pain and endless misery. More hot than a the shafts Detent while she, while she for triumph laughs My sighs and tears More hot than a the shafts Detent while she, while she for triumph Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Now you're going to have to imagine yet another instrument playing the next group. It's going to be the harpsichord, uh, because of Purcell's time, of course, the restoration. This seemed to be the most popular instrument. It would have had a, a bass viol probably playing with it. But in this case, you haven't brought one with you, I think. <laughs> We're not going to have one. Anyway, the, perhaps I, I would have thought Purcell's most famous song, Music for a While.
Contemporary of uh, John, uh, contemporary of Henry Purcell, John Blow, who, uh, who here is talking about a very, very sad thing, how he's de desperately in love and how his wounds are bleeding and all those sort of things, and yet it's set to the most elegant uh, minuet you could possibly imagine. This is The Self Banished by John Blow. It is not the kind of you less than when before your feet I lay, but to prevent the sad increase of hopeless love I keep away in vain. something of a first performance because when Benjamin Britten died, I forget quite when it was, about four years ago or something like that, going through his papers and the pieces which he hadn't published, they found this song, A Hymn to God the Father of Pedham Humphrey, in his arrangement, this time actually for the piano, believe it or not. So this is Hymn to God the Father by Pedham Humphrey, arranged by Benjamin Britten. Thou forgive that sin where I began, which was my sin, though it were done before. Wilt thou forgive that sin through which I run? 
and do run still, oh, still I do reproach when thou hast done, thou hast not done. Forgive that sin by which I've won others to sin and made my sin the goal. Wilt thou forgive that sin which I did shun a year or two? I must, of course, mention those marvellous words are by John Donne, who was Dean of St. Paul's at the same time, of course. And now, oh yes, now we go back to Purcell, and this Purcell, of course, was a great, great man, and he could write in any styles he liked. He liked, write, uh, wrote a lot of uh, church music, songs, um, operas. He also wrote a lot of very, very naughty songs, none of which I can possibly sing here. <laughs> but I think this is probably the closest I can get. Was within the furlong of Edinburgh town In the rosy time of year when the grass was down For me, Chalky Blythe and Gay said to Jenny, making hay They had sit a little dear and prattled his a sultry day He long had courted the black brown maid But Chalky was a wag and would ne'er consent to wed which made a patient fool and proud to their shadow. I cannot, 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 will not, will not buckle to. He told her marriage was grown a mere joke and that no one wedded now but the scoundrel folk. Oh, my dear, should stop living, but I know not what I am. I shall dream of clubs and silly dogs with bottles at their tail. And a gift of gloves and a bomb brace to wear, and a pretty filly foal to ride out and take the air. If he found there with fish and poo, and cry out at their shadow, I cannot, 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 will not, will not buckle to. That you'll give me trinkets, cried she, I believe, but ah, what in return must your poor Jenny give? When my maiden treasure's gone, I must go to London town and must roar and rant and patch and paint and kiss for half a crown. Each drunken fool be obliged for pay and earn a hated living in an odious hole some way. No, 
no, no, no, it ne shall do. For a wife I'll be to you, or I'll never, never, never cannot, will not buckle to. We go, of course, to one of the great, the greatest composers ever. As Beethoven said, this was the greatest composer that ever lived. We are speaking of Handel and his contemporaries. Of course, Handel influenced all the composers who followed him for about 150 years, just much as Wagner did, in fact. They could never quite get away from him. Anyway, we're going to start, I think it's with um, Sendi, isn't it? Yes, Where Are You Walk, the very famous uh, song when uh, Jupiter... The, the god who has um, taken a grand fancy to Semele, the immortal, says that he's going to lay everything at her feet. But of course, she has this fatal flaw of wanting to know exactly who he is in his real form. And of course, his real form can be anything, but it certainly isn't a man. And he has to kill her. He appears as a thunderbolt. He tries to make it a very, very light one. But light thunderbolts can kill just as much as heavy ones can. Anyway, this is where I walk.
now for um, Mr. Shield, who isn't really quite in the same, same class as uh, George Frederick, but nevertheless wrote some very charming operas which were put on constantly during the period in England, one of which I happened to sing in. It was an opera called Rosina, and it's very inconsequential, but extremely pretty, and I think you might get the general taste of his music from this song, The Thorn, by William Shield. On the white blossom snow, my dear Chloe requested a sprig at her breast to adore. On the white blossom snow, my dear Chloe requested a sprig at her breast to adore. Oh, I am, I exclaim, may I pay. If ever I can't in the bosom of home, oh, I heard, I exclaimed, may I perish? If ever I can't in the bosom of home, when I showed her a ring and implored her to marry. She blushed like the dawning of the morn. When I showed her a ring and implored her to marry, she blushed like the dawning of the morn. Yes, I'll consent, she replied, if you promise that no jealous rival shall love me. Oh, I have, I exclaimed, if I perish, if ever I plant in that pool's Thank you very much indeed. You see, it is quite light. It's not, not very consequential, but very pretty. At least I think so. Now, my, I think my second, perhaps most favorite song is the next one on the program. It's Tom Bowling by Charles Dibdin. Now, Charles Dibdin also wrote the words to this. He was a terribly clever man. He was a great entrepreneur. He played many instruments. He did it about everything he could do. Fought with everybody as well, but nevertheless, a very clever man. Now, this piece, Tom Bowling, was written in memory of his brother, who was a seaman and who was killed, killed by lightning at sea. And it became a great favorite of the nation. And George III, the king of the time, decided that it was so important to the uh, health of the nation that he would make Mr. Dibdin uh, a, a salary, really, of 200 pounds a year, simply because he wrote it. Tom Bowling.
Thank you very much indeed. And now before you get your very well-earned drink of coffee or whatever it might be, we go back to George Frederick Handel and this time to the opera Asis and Galatea. And this is again a rather tragic story, of course, because Galatea is pursued by the great one-eyed giant Polyphemus, who takes an extraordinary delight in her. And, and of course, Galatea is Asis' best girlfriend. And he decides, mere mortal though he is, that he's going to fight the great giant for her favors. And it, of course, ends in total disaster because he gets crushed by a huge rock. But nevertheless, this is the song that he sings, Love Sounds the Alarm.
Ladies and gentlemen, it, it was on a trip to uh, Russia where I was singing with the English Opera Group in, mm, I think it was 1965 or something like that, that Benjamin Luxon, my great friend, and I started talking about the songs that our grandparents used to sing. And, uh, and we both realized, of course, that there was a huge treasury of songs which at that time had stopped being performed for some unknown reason. Because in Victorian times, of course, we've, we, we, we've taken up their, their poetry. We know all about that. We certainly think their art is absolutely supreme. You know, it, terribly expensive art it is. And yet the music had never really been touched, apart from Gilbert and Sullivan operas and all that. So anyway, we decided that we'd try and, try and give it its due. And we're very glad we did, because it's, it's, we found some marvelous songs, and it's been greatly appreciated everywhere. So, in this anthology of uh, English song, I would be very remiss to miss out the Victorian songs. And I'm going to start now with when I said in the last half that I thought Tom Bowling was perhaps my favorite song, but I also think Annabel Lee is as well. And we're starting with Annabel Lee, uh, music by Mr. Balfe, and uh, words, it's not Mr. Balfe, is it? Mr. Leslie, you see? I, I, Mr. Balfe wrote other things. Mr. Leslie. Okay, Annabelle Lee. <clears throat> With a love that 
Thank you so much. And now, uh, from, from the opera Maritana, by Mr. Wallace, who I see from the program, was called an Australian Paganini. <laughs> Having left, I don't know, it can't be because he left 2,000 pounds of debts here, could it? No, it can't be that. <laughs> but anyway, this is, um, this, this is a song, um, Yes, Let Me Like a Soldier Fall, which I will hope to find now, because it was done in London at... Uh, so, I can't quite remember when, but it was done in English and in Italian. And the Times critic said, this establishment, this is re referring to the theatre, this establishment closed on the 11th Ultimo, the only important event since our last notice being the Italian version of Maritana. His comment, anything which can disguise the words of Fitzball's original must be beneficial. <laughs> Yes, let me like a soldier fall by Wallace. Oh, 
Another thing which the Victorians were terribly popular, liked doing an awful lot, was arranging folk tunes and tr traditional ballads. This is one of them, My Snowy Breasted Pearl, translated from the Irish by a Dr. Petrie, who I've never met, of course, and arranged by Mr. Moffat, who I also haven't met. very much indeed and now of course the most popular it must be the most popular of all victorian songs come into the garden more words by tennyson and this time it must be mr bow i'm sure yes mr bow <laughs> On a bed of daffodil sky, 
of course, was a Victorian. He was born well within the period. But he changed the whole thing because he became very interested in, in folk song. And you could be well forgiven for thinking that Lyndon Lee is a folk song. In fact, it isn't. It's a song composed totally by him. But it's a very nice transition between the songs we've been listening to now, the Victorian ballads, and a song like The Watermill, which is a completely Vaughan Williams song. So listen to um, Lyndon Lee as if it's a kind of precursor of his real style. Lyndon Lee by Vaughan Williams. Burns to wind. 
You must just wait for one second because I've made an absolute cardinal omission and I have actually forgotten to bring on the next song. Would you just excuse me one second? <laughs> I must say that I do, I do apologize, but it isn't the first time it's happened. I once did it in front of the Queen Mother, which wasn't very funny. I, so anyway, yes, well this is a, no, let's get back to it. Yes, this is the water mill, of course, which is uh, from a lovely poem by Fredegon Schauf. And um, this is, I think, Vaughan Williams's true songwriting style. It's very, you can hear the water running, you can hear the mill wheel going, you can hear the clock striking six when all the work is done. In fact, it's very, it does the same sort of things as Schubert did, but not, obviously not quite like that, but nevertheless, you can hear them all there. Stands 
on a clean scrub board, and a mill and drinks like a thirsty lord. A young man come for his daughter's sake, but she never knows which one to take. She drives her needle and pins her stuff while the moon shines gold and the lamp shines wide. I've done it again. There's another one. Thank, thank you so much, but you're going to think me absolutely mad because I didn't bring it all on that time even. So just give me one minute, would you? I'm off. <laughs> Never mind. Well, another composer, of course, who I got very interested in because I, well, he's a lovely composer to sing, but kind of binds up what we've been saying because we started with um, Lute Song and Dowland. Now, Warlock, Peter Warlock, or Philip Hesseltine, as his name was, um, discovered, was one of the first people to discover these early Renaissance composers. And I was looking through an old junk shop the other day, and I came across a book full of these early arrangements of Dowland and people by Warlock, and they're absolutely marvelous. They've never been bettered, I think. So I'd like to, in fact, end this, this recital and, uh, by singing some of Warlock. I think a very, very good song of his indeed, Sleep, and then to finish, a jolly song called Yarmouth Fair. Oh, 
gone to Yarmouth, where the birds they sang, good day, good day, the birds they sang, good day. Oh, I spied a maid with golden hair, a walking along my way, a tidy little maid, so trim and fair, and the birds they sang, good day, good day, and the birds they sang, good day. I said, my dear, would you ride with me? And the birds they sang, go on, go on, and the birds they sang, go on. She didn't say yes, and she didn't say no, and the birds they sang hey ho, hey ho, and the birds they sang hey ho. I lifted her right onto my mare, oh, light as a feather was she. I'd never set eyes on a girl so fair, so I kissed her bravely, one, two, three, so I kissed her, one, two, three. Then on we rode to Yarmouth, fair, past Peel and Green Hedge Row, and in our hearts the set more care, and the birds they sang hello, hello, and the birds they sang hello. The fun was fast and free, and the birds they sang hurray, hurray, and the birds they sang hurray. Man struck up a lively pair, on fiddle and pipe and drum. The maid and me, we made a pair, and we danced till kingdom come, ho, oh, oh, ho, and we danced till kingdom come. The lads and lasses cheered us on, my pony maid and me. We danced till stars were in the sky, and the birds they sang goodbye, goodbye. And the birds they sang Thank you very much indeed. We'd like to sing an, an English folk song. It's an arrangement by Benjamin Britten of um, a political song of the time. It's called The Ploughboy. You'll notice if you can hear the words that politics haven't changed very much. A flaxen headed cowboy, as simple as can be. And next a merry ploughboy, I whistled o'er the lee. And then the saucy footman, I strut in worsted lace. And soon I'll be a butler, and play my jolly face. When steward I'm promoted, I'll slip the tradesman's bill. My master's coffers empty, my pockets for to fill. Why, lying in my chariot, so great a man I'll be. So great a man, so great a man, so great. Little flower that whistled o'er the lee. You forget the little flower that whistled o'er the lee. I'll buy one some directions, and when I've made the pair, I'll stand poor for the Parliament and then vote in myself. Whatever's good for me, sir, I never will oppose. When all my eyes are sold off, why then I'll sell my nose. Vote harangue and paragraph with speeches charm the ear. And when I'm tied on my legs, then I'll sit down up here in court or sit in honor. So great a man I'll be, so great a man, so great a man, so great a man I'll be. You forget the little flower that whistled o'er the lee. You forget the little flower that whistled o'er the lee.
now another folk song arrangement. This, uh, this song has a very, very pertinent last line. I hope you hear it, but it's, uh, it's again, it's arranged by Benjamin Britten. It's called Oliver Cromwell. <laughs> Oliver Cromwell lay buried and dead. He ho buried and dead. They grown an apple tree over his head. He ho over his head. The apples were ripe and ready to fall. He ho ready to fall. They came with a woman to gather them all. He ho gather them all. Oliver rose and gave her a drop. He ho gave her a drop, which made the old woman go hippity hop. He ho hippity hop. The saddle and bridle lay on the shelf. He ho lie on the shelf. If you want any more, you can sing it yourself. He ho sing it yourself. Thank <laughs> you.